So let's continue our discussion of functions. Uh, this is still in our first basic unit in the course, which is about sets. And remember that we're going to understand sets well so that we can take sets and build from them uh, graph theory and then some other cool theories as well. And so uh, last time we covered some of the very basic notation definitions for sets. Now uh, let's talk about some, I'm sorry, for functions. Ah, at some point, maybe you'll get to a point where you just completely don't think about sets and functions so differently. Um, and then you'll also make all these same verbal flubs. Okay, um, one of the more um, common uh, uh, characterizations or classes of functions you'll, you will encounter are the so-called injective functions. Oops, in Injective functions. And in pictures, you're right, this is the functions where everybody maps to someone different, right? So every point in the domain maps to a distinct element in the codomain. And it looks almost like a kind of uh, matching. Now, it might be that there are other things over here in the codomain that, you know, that nobody maps to by this function, um, but that's fine. It's, this is injective. If it is the case that everybody on, in the codomain Every element of the codomain is the image of some uh, element in the domain under the function, then uh, that would be called surjective. So, um, draw a picture of this as well. So, here is um, right, everybody in X maps to somebody in Y. Of course, that's what it means to be a function, but in this case, every element of y, there's just the two here, is, um, is equal to f of x for some x. So um, that would be a surjective function. And you also will see other words for this. Sometimes you see this called uh, one to one. Um, and sometimes you see this as onto. Okay, and, it, and if it helps you to remember this onto, right, it's going onto the set, sort of covering the set. Um, and you see the sur and the on, right? This is a sort of Latin root. Uh, it's actually sur in French is just on. So um, it'll help you hopefully to remember this connection. And uh, the formal definition here would be that x um, not equal to x prime implies that f of x is not equal to f of x prime. And that is, if you have distinct elements over here, little x, little x prime, uh, they're going to map to distinct elements over here. And a function is surjective, if this means what? That as the everything that you can reach, uh, which is we call the image of the function, is all of y. So you can just write this as the image of f is equal to the set y. Okay, so that's injective and surjective functions. And then we also say that a function is bijective, If, um, if it's both injective and surjective. Okay. Um, these are also sometimes called correspondences, although we have to be a little bit careful because that's a technical term in some other areas that uh, we might want to steer clear of. Um, so these words, uh, injective, surjective, bijective, those are uh, adjectives. Um, so I'll write it like this, right? So one of these, you might say that this was a, a bijective function. Um, there's also the noun form of this. This is, these, each of these, one of these would be um, also called a, um, either a bijection, I'll write them all out. This is the noun form or an injection or a surjection. So I'll use both these words um, and hopefully we'll get the parts of speech right, right? This is the adjective, these are the nouns. All right, good. So, bijections are, um, in a way, they give you the basic starting point for doing counting. And in a way, you can count things in a really crude way 
without numbers. Yeah, and I'll give you an example. Like if you give a small child who can't count um, two stacks of coins, they might still be able to tell you which stack is bigger, like which has more coins in it. And if they stack them and you just put the stacks next to each other, you will see like one stack is higher. And the reason um, you can then infer that that stack actually has more coins is because there is a kind of correspondence, right? The bottom layer coins match up the next layer coins and there's a matching all the way up. And uh, if one of them has extra, then you know there's more coins in that set. Or if you want to set, tell that they're the same, you could just see that they have the same size. And having a um, correspondence then tells you kind of immediately about sizes of things. So, um, and I just use the word correspondence when I, I said we should, we're going to be careful about. But having that kind of bijection between two sets tells you that they have the same size. Right, this is a, a simple fact. Um, uh, we should be careful though. It, um, because we're going to want to extend this to apply not just to those finite sets, but also to infinite sets. But here's a little fact um, that you can, you can work out for yourself that if x and y are finite sets, um, and uh, there exists a bijection, uh, let's call it f from x to y, then the size of x is equal to the size of y. Now, uh, these uh, set cardinalities, we said that we want to be able to talk about these also for infinite sets, and, and we can extend this idea um, pretty directly. Uh, in that if we can talk about bijections between infinite sets, um, which nothing in our definitions precludes us from doing that, um, we can also talk about having uh, the same cardinality um, for infinite sets as well. Um, one other fact I'm just going to throw out here um, that you may have seen before is that bijections have inverses. And um, what that means, actually you can First, think about uh, why that's true and how you would construct it. And uh, usually we use this uh, raised to the minus one power for inverses. This is kind of borrowing from our intuition about um, multiplicative inverses, where if you raise a number to the minus one power, you get its multiplicative inverse. Um, so a function raised to the minus one here is the inverse of f. And so this, hopefully, it should the type of this function, if f maps x to y, it should be a mapping from y to x, and in particular f inverse of uh, an element y should be uh, the, the unique x such that, st is such that, I'm going to use this a lot, um, such that f of x is equal to y. So we kind of defined it to have this power uh, of kind of undoing the function f, right? That is f inverse of f right, is going to be the identity and actually vice versa as well if it's a bijection. Okay, so um, uh, this is, um, oh, we, this is actually not quite complete. We should really say what um, these identity functions, remember there's an identity function for each set. So since we have two sets, we have x and y, we have two different identity functions. And so we should figure out uh, which of these identities we have, right? So f inverse of f should be a function that takes x to x, right? Because f takes x to y, and then we take it y back to x. So this is going to be the identity on x. And this one, f inverse takes us uh, elements of y, maps them into x, and then use, we use f to bring it back into y. So this is the identity on y. Now, <clears throat> It turns out that we could have defined um, bijections in this way, right? That they, functions that have such an inverse, and um, and and that's going to be um, that's going to be an okay thing for us to do. And let's let's try to take this this form, this idea that there's a function and another function that comes in, they come in pairs, and when you put them together, you get identity. Um, that these are somehow special. And we're going to give it a new name, in fact. We're going to call this um, isomorphism. Uh, in this case, it's isomorphism for sets. 
And um, before we, we had a notion of equality for sets, right? We said that sets were equal, right? This means uh, same elements, exactly the same elements in the two sets. Now we're gonna have this new one, which is isomorphism. And um, this, this relation will hold if there's a bijection between the sets. And, um, but we're gonna define it um, more in terms of the existence of these inverses. So um, we're gonna say that A is isomorphic to B, if, where these are two sets. Um, that's gonna be true if and only if there exists. Um, I'll write it like this, shorthand, right? There's function F, let's call F from A to B, and let's say some other function G from B to A such that um, f composed with g is equal to the identity on b and g composed with f is equal to the identity on a so these are the kinds of uh, inverses of each other and in this case we would say that um, right this definition here is the definition of the uh, the notation um, but these functions f and g are isomorphisms. So an isomorphism is in, a, in sets is a function. So these are the isomorphisms. And we would say that a and b are isomorphic. And that's actually how you would pronounce this a is isomorphic to b. And you'll notice also that there is a no, nothing special about the ordering, right? Because we have it in both directions here. Uh, if A is isomorphic to B, then B is also isomorphic to A. And that probably would be clear as well from just the definition in terms of bijections. Okay, so that's what we're gonna mean by isomorphism of sets. So it gives us a different equivalence relation. Uh, I think we'll leave it as an exercise to prove that this is a full-on equivalence relation. Um, it, but, but it gives us a different kind of equ uh, way of equating sets that's not the same as just having all the elements be the same. Um, and we're going to need this a lot. We're going to use this especially when we talk about uh, isomorphism of graphs later in the course. It's going to be one of the most fundamental ideas that we deal with. Um, it's actually going to underlie every graph property we, we study. All right. All right, so let's do something cool with this. Um, now that we have this other kind of equality or equivalence for, for sets, we can now prove a classic uh, theorem. Um, and really, the, the theorem is, is cool and all, but the method is where it gets interesting. It's really going to give us the method of diagonalization. So I'm going to prove to you that the set of natural numbers, that's an infinite set, is not isomorphic to its power set. Um, now that's in some ways not surprising because if you took any finite set, you know that any finite set is, is uh, not going to be isomorphic to its power set. Um, uh, except maybe is the empty set isomorphic to the power set? Um, maybe. Maybe. Um, but in this case, um, it starts to get a little bit more complicated because if you just t think of this isomorphism as naively telling you that the sizes are the same, that, that then you say, well, this one's infinite and this one's infinite. Maybe, um, maybe they're both infinite. Maybe they sh there should be an isomorphism between them, um, but there's not. And here's how you prove it. So this is uh, this is the ca classic uh, Cantor diagonalization approach. Um, so it's a proof by contradiction. So we'll suppose for contradiction that we actually do have an isomorphism. So suppose um, we have, uh, right, there exists some functions, let's call them, let's say f takes us from n into the power set of n. So that means uh, for any number, it gives me a set of numbers. And g takes us back. So that means for any set of numbers, it gives me a number. Um, and if this is an isomorphism, then uh, in particular, uh, it will mean that uh, f composed with g is the identity on the power set here. 
Again, remember the power set is going to be, the power set on the natural numbers is going to be the set of sets of numbers. All right. Now, once I have this, I can define a new set. I'm going to call it D for diagonal. And um, it's just going to be a subset of the natural numbers where n, instead of all these little n's, where n is not an element of f of n. Right? In other words, n is in D if and only if n is not in f of n. All right? Now, in particular, I can take um, a number, and I'm going to take the number g of d, because remember, g takes us from sets to numbers. There's a number. So g of d is in d, if and only if, and, oh, sorry, g of d is not in f of g of d. And now here's where we're in trouble because this is f of g. This is f composed with g, which is just the identity. So this, this is just the identity function. So this just is equal to d. And now we have some weirdness because we have g of d is in d, if and only if it's not in d. Right? That's clearly a logical contradiction. Um, and so that contradiction implies that uh, no such isomorphism exists. Okay, and so, so then we've proven the non-existence of this isomorphism. We've proven that these, these two sets are not isomorphic um, by this, this so-called diagonal argument. Now, um, it may not be immediately clear from this simple drawing like why it would be called the diagonal argument or a diagonal method. So let me just draw another quick picture. You see, we had the number, the natural numbers. One, um, let me put them across here. So here's one, two, three, four, etc. And um, if I were to try to describe the sets now, I can take um, this, all the sets in the power set of n. I can write them. Well, here's there's. I can write them like this. Here's f of one, right? F of two, f of three, etc. And what I can do is I can take each column and say, look, uh, either it's in the set or it's not. So let's do it like this. Let's say uh, a 0 means it's not in the set. A 1 means it's in the set. So if it happened to be the case that, say, f of 1 was equal to the set 2, 4, just for, some, for example, um, this, is what I would, this is how I'd fill in this table. And if as I start filling this in, I might as well go all the way down at least to 4. Um, right, I can write down some different sets. And etc. I fill in this whole table. And now that set that I defined, remember it was defined as follows. D was a set of all natural numbers such that n was not in f of n. That's kind of like taking the diagonal here, looking at, um, right, because if you want to ask if a given number is in f of n, that's asking whether or not we have a 0 or a 1 here. So I go along the diagonal, and I'm really just creating a new set, which is going to swap each of these, right? So the new set D has, it's going to have the 1 because 1 is not in f of 1. It's not going to have the 2 because the 2 is in f of 2. And we go through the whole uh, infinite number of natural numbers this way to, to build this set D. And the result is that this new set is somehow not on the list because it differs on, uh, in exactly one place with every element on the list. So usually what you would do is you'd say, suppose it really uh, was on the list, right? If this was a complete list of, right, this is supposed to be the list of the power set of N. If that's a complete list, then D should appear somewhere on the list, but we find that D kind of differs in exactly one element, and it's going to be in the diagonal element, which was actually just uh, G of D. All right, so, um, so this is kind of the picture of why this is the diagonal aspect of the diagonal argument. Um, although, as we saw, um, you don't really need a picture to see, like, it, it actually follows quite directly from writing it out this way. You most often see this for uh, proof that the set of 
real numbers is somehow a bigger infinity than the set of natural numbers. Um, and you can do that as well. Um, but I think the, the set version is, is cleaner. All right, so just a quick recap. We talked about surjective and injective functions. We used them to build bijections. And then we talked about isomorphism. And uh, one of the key points I want to highlight about isomorphism is that the definition really just came from having a notion of composition and a notion of an identity function. Right, so these two things combine to give us a notion of isomorphism. And then from isomorphism, we can use it to do uh, fun things like diagonalization. Right. And um, I'm gonna keep mentioning this about how important composition and identity are um, because we're gonna, um, again, we're gonna have other objects that have notions of composition, have notions of identity, and then we're gonna immediately get a definition of isomorphism, which is exactly the same as the one we have for sets um, because all it's gonna say is that we have, if we have um, maps, functions, or sometimes more generally called just morphisms from one object to another and, an ob and another one to come back, if you compose them and you get the identity in both directions, that's gonna give you isomorphism. So we'll see that again and again.